Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. Black crows cawed shrilly on the branches of a stunted fir tree. Nicholas turned to look at the scavengers and stumbled, almost falling. He grabbed the shoulder of Andrew, who was ahead of him. Back off. He snapped, shaking his arm nervously. We're not taking her anywhere. Nicholas swallowed hard. A lump of rotten meat lodged in his throat. Nauseous, disgusting. The back of the third boy, Jack, was getting lost in the thicket ahead. And Nicholas picked up his pace to keep up. Not to get lost. Not to stay in the night forest with her. The crows cawed more anxiously, beating their wings. And Nicholas stumbled. Suddenly, vividly, too colorfully imagining them flying down to eat. So Jack, stopping, waited for his buddies. He stood with his legs spread wide, clenched fists and clenched jaws, as if he was going to fight them. Remember everything. We dropped her off and moved on. All right. We don't know where she went. Okay. Andrew nodded as desperately as if he had a spring in his neck. Why don't you say something? You got your tongue out. Nicholas heard himself being shouted at and squeezed his eyes shut. His stomach twisted as if he'd eaten something wrong. Cold drops of sweat slid down his back, caressing him. In the back of his mind was the thought that everything that had happened was wrong, that they had made a big mistake. But it wasn't too late to fix it. But he couldn't get the words out of his mouth, because Jack's eyes said, If you're not with us, boy, you're against us. And then perhaps you'd better take a place with her under the fir trees. There's plenty of room for everyone. And the crows are hungry for a mournful feast. Yes, I understand. At the edge of hearing, Nicholas replied, There's a good boy. Jack grinned and turned and strode confidently forward. There were about 300 and 400 meters to go, and then they were at the edge of the highway, where Andrew's father's old car was parked near the sign that showed the distance to the city. Three young boys, and on this day they were all graduating. Also, it just so happened that they were all turning 18, which made them all feel really, really grown up and able to go their own way in life. But the first stop turned out to be a nightmare because Jack offered to celebrate the graduation in a special way. Why don't we take Nika to the club? He suggested it the day before, when the classmates gathered behind the garage, where they drank energy. So to speak, they started celebrating in advance. Nika. Andrew's eyes widened. What's wrong with you, Jack? Are there no more women on the ground? He laughed. There are no women, but Nika is one. Jack smirked. She's a real piece of work. Don't you want to? Want what? Nicholas didn't understand. He couldn't figure out why they were talking about the most disgusting girl in the school. And his head was tight because of the energy drink, which, by the way, he drank only for company, so as not to be labeled a man. In general, the idea of having fun with girls at graduation seemed to Nicholas the most natural thing in the world. When else to light up, as not on this holiday, when the hated school is behind you, and you are now quite an adult, a mature man. True, before that it was about dancing, making out with ordinary normal girls. But now it's about Nick. What is it, Nicholas thought. Are you out of your mind? Nika was the kind of girl who wasn't looked at at school with anything other than mocking disdain, contempt, or at best pity. Nika's parents were a couple of alcoholics who had long ago lost their human appearance, so it was no surprise that she came to school as a bum. In clothes out of size, with a swing, not conged, and some kind of all shuganaya. In the school cafeteria with her no one, and never sat at the same table, and in the classroom to sit at the same desk with her well, it was such a nasty thing that the guys were ready to write tests and do all the homework just so that the teacher had mercy and sent away from the scarecrow. Nika had the worst grades. They even said that she would be transferred to a remedial school, but she stayed in the regular one and pissed everyone off. She's stupid because of her mother. I once explained it to those who don't know. Lily, the school's queen and the most popular girl, well, she was such a slut. And Lily used a bad word for women who sell themselves. 
That's why Nika was born, mentally retarded. Now I see why her father, her mother, beats her up. Jack laughed. Couldn't forgive the whore. Why not? Maybe Nika will be her type. She'll think with her brain, too, he added, and grinned. Jack, who was considered to be the main leader in the class, in the school in general, didn't like any, as he said, defective people at all. Not that he liked to pick on them, but he didn't stand aside. If it was necessary to poke his nose and show who should occupy what place in the social hierarchy. And just before graduation, just when there were important tests, Neka committed a very bad deed. It so happened that she somehow got to know that the geography report, for which Jack got an A, he hadn't written himself. So she told the headmaster herself. Jack, of course, was furious. Everyone at school thought he was going to kill Nika. But it was like he forgave and forgot. And everyone thought that maybe he was just being nice because graduation was coming up. But it wasn't that simple. You're a fool, Nicholas. Jack smirked. What do you want? To spend your whole life as a sucker? No, boys, that's not the way my father raised me. I remember the good, but I don't forget the bad. He said pompously. He finished his energy drink in a gulp and crumpled the can in his hand. When we go to the club, I say, let's take Neko with us, and then we'll go for a little ride. So, Andrew craned his neck. What are you up to? Whatever you're up to, don't do it, Nicholas wanted to say, but kept silent because he didn't want to be called a coward and a mama's boy. And that Jack licked his lips, to teach her a lesson, to scare her, so that in the future he would learn how not to behave. What's the matter with you two? He chuckled, we'll scare the idiotic fool a little, and then we'll go to the club and see the girls. I'm sorry, but I probably won't be allowed to go to the club, said Nicholas. And anyway, everyone goes to the cafe after graduation. What club? Let the little things go to the cafe, Nicholas said seriously. And we are already adults. So yes, and Nika is no longer a child, too, he added thoughtfully and scratched in his pants. Let her know how to take responsibility for her words in an adult way. All right, enough with the language, that my boys are like old women on the bench. Let's talk about the future. You, Nicholas, what do you think you're gonna do next? With what? I don't get it. With boogers in his nose, Jack shouted and flicked him painfully on the forehead. Honestly, you're as dumb as if you and Nico were twins. I'm asking you what you're going to do with your life. Well, I'll go to college, Nicholas answered, to be a manager. Mom says it's better to focus on banking, and I myself would like to be in the tourism industry, and I will study welding at a technical school, said Andrew. Jack looked at his comrades importantly. So you will be workhorses. You're not going to be like that, Andrew snorted. I'm going into business. Jack answered importantly. My mother and father have been saving money, and now they're going to send me to America. When I study economics at the university for a couple of years as a student, I'll go there for the summer and get citizenship. I'll make a business. Wow. Andrew rounded his eyes. You've already learned English. Why were you babbling in class? It's just school. Jack dismissed it. My parents will pay for tutors. You'll get everything right there. Let's go home, boys, it's getting dark. Why are you afraid of the dark? Andrew poked him. He's afraid of it. Jack poked Nicholas in the ribs. I just have to be home by eight at the latest. My parents, for God's sake, tell me to behave myself. What do I do? I have to pay for America. Jack's cunning plan lodged in Nicholas's mind like a thorn in the side of a shoe. He couldn't take a step without remembering it. Teaching Nika a lesson didn't sound so bad. After all, he wouldn't seriously beat a girl, break her nose or leg, for example. Nika wasn't the best person, of course. Quiet, eyes downcast, mumbling. But in the last school year Nicholas, to his surprise and also to his horror, suddenly began to look at her with different eyes. He suddenly noticed that under all those baggy, scratchy sweaters, and strict black pants hides a slender, with the proper forms of a girl's body. He suddenly noticed how big Nikki's blue eyes were, 
One day at recess he caught her at the window. She was weaving a braid, and her raven black hair lay lush and full on her back and shoulders. She gave him a questioning look, saying, What do you want? And he was embarrassed, and hurried away. But in the evening he could not sleep for a long time, again and again, with a strange feeling returning to this picture. And a couple of days before graduation Nicholas suddenly thought that he would love to go to the café. Let there be a gathering of, as Jack had said, a bunch of, as Jack had said, small potatoes. But Nika had to be there too, and Nicholas also thought he could ask her to dance. Why not? After all, she was a girl, and he doubted she had a date for the prom. Because Nick is invisible, homeless, and invisible to everyone an object of ridicule. But what's she like outside of school? She's a person too. And he doesn't know what she's like outside the classrooms, the corridors, the cafeteria. Not until the schoolyard, which is where she's from, by the way. For as long as he can remember, she's never left. She ran out as if she were out there in the big world. A different life could be waiting for her. And Nicholas also felt a little sorry for Nika, in the sense that she had been very unlucky with her parents. After all, he thought, must be the worst thing when your parents drink day after day, and you realize that it's not getting better, you realize that it will only get worse. Yeah, Nicholas didn't have that problem himself, fortunately. But he had friends who were unlucky enough to have relatives with alcohol addiction. And according to their stories, he very vividly imagined what it is like to grow up, in general to live in such an atmosphere. That, as they say, is something you wouldn't wish on an enemy. The order invited her, Jack told her the day before graduation. She's so dumb, she's stuttering her eyes out. She's shaking with excitement. She's asking me how come. Are you inviting me? And I said, it's nothing. It's just Nika. We're graduating from high school. So I thought we should make up, because it's not good. We've been oppressing you for years. So I decided it's time to settle things in an adult way. Anyway, she's coming with us. Jack winked. Nicholas swallowed hard. There was no turning back. And actually, the further it went, the less he liked it. Of the three guys, only Andrew had a driver's license, but none of them had a car of their own. But Andrew had managed to talk his dad into giving them a car for graduation. And so toward evening, when the official part of the celebration at school was over, when they had walked around in the park and along the promenade, Jack slowly pulled Nika to the side. Nika. This day, she was a different person than Nicholas was used to seeing her in instead of the usual pants or floor-length skirts. Today the girl was wearing a dress. It was a very simple black dress with exposed shoulders. But how good she looked. And today Nika did not put her hair in a braid, but gathered it in a lush, deliberately sloppy bundle on her head. The look was completed by a pair of small-heeled shoes. Nicholas could hear the schoolgirls, dressed up in silks and sequins, colorful and bright, laughing at the fact that even on a day like this, Nika was still a dunce. But to Nicholas, she was the most beautiful today. By the time they loaded into the car, Nicholas had already had a drink. The thing was, Jack had brought the bottle in the afternoon and poured the contents into cups for the three of them. What was that? Andrew sniffed. Vodka. It's vodka. The leader of the little group chuckled. What did they think? It was not time to pour lemonade today. I won't, said Nicholas. He hadn't drunk any hard liquor at all, and was familiar with energy drinks at most. You will, Jack said confidently, or you're not a man, but a snot, that your mom will scold you, put you in a corner. He laughed and whimpered teasingly. I'm afraid of mommy. Mommy will spank me. Nicholas got blood on his face. What a shame. Yes, Jack wasn't just laughing at him. The thing was that Nicholas, unlike his buddies, Nicholas had a single-parent family. His mother raised him, and his mother-in-law, an old grandmother, lived with them. And then there was Kate, his three-year-old sister. No father. He died almost two years ago in a car accident. And since then, Mom, who had a temper before, had taken it out on her son. 
chased him so that the smoke could smoke in the neighborhood and in the middle of the street to reprimand and grab him by the ear. And one day, about a year ago, she was called to school. Come here, you rascal, Pam shouted, chasing Nicholas down the school hallway. And as luck would have it, the hallway was full of people. Somebody tripped Nicholas, and Nicholas went nose down, and his mother, in general, belted him on the heel, in front of all the people. Nicholas roared like a little boy. I've never been so hurt and ashamed in my life. Naturally, his reputation wasn't just ruined, it was ruined, and he would have become a pariah, perhaps, had it not been for the intercession of Jack, whose word meant a great deal at school. But Jack himself found an opportunity to recall that shameful incident, mostly when he had to get Nicholas to do something dangerous or not quite legal, like stealing cigarettes from a store. Anyway, Nicholas drank the vodka. It was disgusting. And then he had another drink. And it so happened that by the time he and Nika got into the car, he was already pretty drunk. Isn't the club in town? Asked the girl after a while when the car was already rushing along the country highway. Yes, we are here now. Jack answered from the front passenger seat. We need to solve one thing. Nika, how are you doing? Andrew asked to lighten the atmosphere. It was obvious that he didn't like the whole thing either. But he, like Nicholas, did not dare to contradict Jack. So the girl sighed. Mom and Dad will probably get divorced, and I've decided to enter the seamstress. I can't wait to move into a dormitory. I'm gonna make so many beautiful dresses for myself. She was talking about something else. Nicholas could hardly understand. He was terribly seasick, and he was afraid he was going to throw up. The car slowed down. Jack got out first, opened the back door, and roughly yanked Nika out of the cabin. Ouch, the girl squeaked. Don't move. Jack grinned. And don't yell. We just want to talk. What? I don't understand what you're doing. Jack slapped her on the back and told her again to be quiet. And then he dragged her into the woods. It was about five meters from the curb, no more than five meters. I don't like this, Nicholas muttered, following them. I like it already. Andrew laughed. He was already drunk, too. He'd find out. It turned out to be eerily easy to go deep into the forest, where it was so wild that it would seem that human civilization was hundreds of miles away. And at first everything seemed to go as if it was going according to plan. Jack, holding Nika by both wrists, was yelling in her face with a deadening grip. He was so sick of her. What a piece of trash she was, and how he hated her for ruining his life with that test. The girl immediately burst into tears, sniffling her nose she apologized, saying that yes, she had made a mistake. She didn't know what had come over her. But she really, really, really apologizes. On your knees. Jack growled and pushed Nika into the position he'd named. He ran his fingers through her hair and yanked, tilting her head back so that she cried out in pain. Are you going to apologize properly now, you bitch? Nicholas, standing nearby, bent in half, vomiting. His ears were noisy. His head was spinning, and he felt as if he had never felt worse in his life. But in parallel, he saw and understood everything that was happening right in front of him, and it was like a nightmare. And, as in a nightmare dream, he could not control his body now. And it was, as they say, betraying him completely. He was sickened to see what his friends were doing, but he could not look away. And even, as he realized with horror, he didn't want to. No, Nicholas thought with despair, I can't like what I see and hear. It's not right. But the body decided otherwise. And then, he has woken up only after it was over and how it was over. Nika broke free from her tormentors and probably wanted to run away. Their hands were reaching for her again, and he was among them, reaching for her, as if he knew nothing in life sweeter than a hungry predatory creature reaching for a gray piece of meat, and she almost ran away, but suddenly she fell. Tripping over a rock here in the woods there were boulders everywhere. There was a nasty sound like a watermelon being dropped, and the girl froze. Jack leaned over her, 
touched her head, the back of her head, then looked at his fingers, and then he backed away. Let's get out of here, he spat out. Come on. What happened? Andrew asked in a catchy voice. What's wrong with her? Nothing. And we didn't take her for a ride, Jack said in chopped up sentences. We dropped her off in town. Okay. Let's go back. What about her? Andrew asked. Are you an asshole? Jack grabbed the guy by the scruff of the neck and shook him so hard his teeth clattered. Do you want to live? Do you want to go to technical school? Do you want a normal life? Then you shut your mouth. Is that clear? And that goes for you too. Jack turned to Nicholas. Let's go. And they walked out of the woods. Behind them, the crows were dancing on the tree. And then the boys came out of the woods, got in the car, and drove into town. Brother, get up. Along with a child's voice ringing with joy, Nicholas was awakened by a considerable weight bearing down on his stomach. That cape jumped on him again, sleeping peacefully. Eh, I told the little girl not to do that a hundred times. But she seemed to enjoy torturing him. Good morning, goat. Nicholas smiled when he was able to breathe, and grabbed the girl and started tickling her. She squealed at the ultrasonic level. The sun was shining brightly through the window. It was a clear summer morning, which put an end to the nightmare in which he relived what had happened in the woods the night after graduation. That's it. That's enough. Standing in the bathroom, Nicholas splashed his face with ice water once more and wiped it all off with a towel. When he entered the kitchen, his mother was frying pancakes, and Kate was sitting at the table, chattering her legs. Granny was still asleep, by the looks of it. She'd been sleeping a lot lately and taking a lot of medication. The doctors waved their hands and said, What do you want? Age and a chronically weak heart. So you should be glad she's still alive. How's work going? Pam asked. It's okay. Nicholas rolled his eyes. Just talking about work wasn't enough. He invited the young people who could do nothing when they were students. He had no such luxury, and now in the summer, was, as they say, the hottest time to earn money. Nicholas, for the past four years, has had time to be in courier and waiter and handyman at the flea market, but there was never enough money, and still ahead loomed the graduation from university, after which he, a young specialist, be he even three times excellent, of course, will not be welcomed anywhere with open arms. So far he had no work experience, and his family had no influential acquaintances to take care of him. Jack was the lucky one, Nicholas thought, chewing his pancake grimly. He'd gone to America recently, and his parents had done everything they'd promised. He'll probably catch on there with his grip, maybe even become a millionaire. However, he often tried not to think about Jack, and before his departure they were not close friends, in general, between them, yours. Then, after school, as a crack ran, they sharply began to communicate less, and Nicholas knew the reason perfectly well. The former friends were bound and separated at the same time by a dark secret, a secret that made Nicholas think he was going gray for the first time. In fact, time was like a crazy, nauseating kaleidoscope. Mecca survived. The girl was lucky to stumble upon a homeless man who'd forgotten something in the woods. They carried her out to the humans. And that's where it got messy. I mean, word got out about what happened to the girl, of course. But the perpetrators didn't. Nika wouldn't say who it was. And yes, she kept saying she'd asked to be dropped off in the suburbs herself because she'd changed her mind about going to the club. And then the amnesia. Why hadn't she said anything? Jack, smirking, said she was afraid of them. So she shut up. Andrew was of the opinion that Nika didn't want a dirty fight. And Nicholas in general for a long time it seemed to him that he was going crazy because he still could not understand. And he is involved in it. I mean clearly, like everyone else, he remembered it well. But what had compelled him to do it? And he sort of even found the answer alcohol. They say that drunks sometimes do things they can't do when they're sober, so he was driven. Plus, it was his first girlfriend, so he got tempted when he saw the other two. But it didn't make much sense, 
Nicholas thought more that he was self-deceiving to assuage his conscience. But life, as they say, went on, and he wasn't going to tell anyone. And not because he was afraid of Jack, but because, well, why spoil his life, when there is still a mother and grandmother, sister, which he, as the only man in the family, should take care of. Besides, if Nika decided to keep quiet, maybe it's easier for her, maybe it'll make her life easier, maybe she'd be able to forget everything. Nicholas convinced himself that he was just respecting her choice. It wasn't much of an argument after all, but it helped keep him going. And then, anyway, Neka, soon, as it became known, through a dozen acquaintances left town. Her parents said she'd gone to study, and then they divorced and split the apartment. And Nikki's mom left, too. Her father stayed behind. He lived, I think, in a communal flat somewhere and continued to drink heavily. Nicholas, who was in a bad mood, he lazily ate his breakfast and listened to his mother saying, they need money, he needs to work, and she's tired of pulling everything alone. And look me, said Pam, if you're with your baby Sophie, she shivered, for little Kate was sitting beside her. So, you know, love is love, son, but I don't need a new couple of young parents around here. Nicholas grimaced like a lemon. He was sick of his mother prying into his private life. He and Sophie hadn't gone so far as to risk having a child. Sophie had only come into his life six months ago, but he'd realized right away that she was the kind and funny one. Beautiful, but the kind of flashy girl who literally knows her own worth. With her appearance, Nicholas realized that there could be something really good in his life. Sophie was a wonderful girl from an intelligent family, in which all were teachers and doctors, and in general then a secret from the world. But Nicholas was already thinking of proposing to her after they had finished their studies. Finally, breakfast was over. Nicholas began to get ready for work. This time he found a place in the city park, where he released tickets for the rides. Here you go, he said, handing the ticket to another weekday vacationer. And then he recoiled, because Andrew peered through the kiosk window. Nicholas, whispered the former best friend Nicholas, we need to talk. Oh, for fuck's sake. Nicholas got angry. What do you want? Do you want a wheel or a boat? Do you want a ticket? No. Well, don't let me stop you from working. Andrew sighed noisily and stepped away from the window. But Nicholas didn't go anywhere, did he? He's just standing there. With a curse through his teeth, Nicholas hung up the sign. He took a fifteen-minute break and went outside. What do you want again? He asked, walking over to the guy who stood in the shade, hood, sweatshirt pulled low, hands in his pockets, hunched over, pale and skinny, shadows under his eyes, like a ghost. Nicholas suspected Andrew was taking something bad. He'd been a bit of a mess lately and he was talking nonsense. I'm not giving you any money. They've got their belts tightened, he said. They're coming for me. Andrew whispered, his eyes bulging. They called again, saying you're dead. You're at it again, you psycho. Nicholas hummed incredulously, but he felt uncomfortable. Andrew had become like this back in the early spring, when he'd supposedly started getting calls from unknown numbers saying they knew about his dark secret. Andrew couldn't find out who was calling, and naturally, couldn't turn to anyone for help. Otherwise, he would have had to tell them what, exactly, the matter was. But the darkest thing was that the one who called did not demand money for silence, but simply hinted at the fact that soon it would be necessary to pay for the evil done. All in all, Andrew had reason to freak out, and so did Nicholas. Only he was still braving it, because it was kind of delusional, because he couldn't even guess who Nikki's parents were. They didn't want a daughter at all. Nika herself, too pretentious for that girl. Who else? Maybe her current boyfriend. No. That seemed unbelievable. And actually sometimes Nicholas thought Andrew might have made it up. Because lately Andrew had been seeing a psychiatrist. His mother referred him to one, found some dodgy private clinic that treated insomnia and Andrew went there for procedures and brainwashing sessions while talking to a specialist and taking pills. 
Anyway, the guy was really screwed. And he started to sleep, but he had nightmares. And now he's pissed at Nicholas. We have to find Nika. Andrew once said, She has to forgive us, or she can do whatever she wants to us. Otherwise we'll never rest as damned souls. Nicholas was afraid not for his friend, but that he would take his noble ideas to the masses, so to speak. Not that everyone would believe it, of course. Especially since Andrew is a psychiatric patient. But such rumors can tarnish a reputation. And now Nicholas, freaking out that his break to eat and go to the bathroom is wasted on this moron. He was telling Andrew that he'd better stop fooling around, that nothing would happen to him, and that it was all just nerves. Moreover, the incoming calls were not displayed on the phone for some reason. There was no trace of them, and Nicholas, not believing that such a thing was technically possible, was more inclined to the version that Andrew was really crazy. Listen, signing, Nicholas patted Andrew on the shoulder. You need a change of scenery, or what? Well, think about it. How do you do it all? My mother wants me to go to a clinic, Andrew said, blinking pitifully. She says they'll cure me. Put me in a new house. I don't think so, said Nicholas. And then who will hire you with a certificate? She says in a foreign clinic somewhere far away, where everything is confidential. Your parents probably have no money to spend. Nicholas was surprised. You said that you do not have much. And she scraped through her relatives, Andrew whispered. She'll take out a loan. In fact, I'm kind of free. This is where in the world so generously laughed Nicholas, but on his back ran goosebumps. Foreigners get everything for free. Yes, my psychiatrist did the work. Why? Would it help? Andrew jumped nervously in his seat. Maybe I'll sleep better. Okay, okay. Nicholas was dying to get rid of him. You go on. I've got work to do. Andrew left. And Nicholas gave him a sympathetic look. The guy's life was a mess. He learned to be a welder, but he worked so hard that he almost hurt someone on the construction site. Now he's on pills. I don't know what's gonna happen next. Will he be cured? Nicholas came home that day in a gloomy mood. Unintentionally rude to his mother at dinner, then rolled his eyes at his mother's request tomorrow to go to the other side of town, where the pharmacy found medicine for his grandmother. And to round out the evening, Nicholas also chased away Kate, who had asked him to help with a craft for kindergarten. He should have brought something made out of spruce cones the other day. Okay, Nicholas thought. If the day wasn't going to work out, the only thing to do was just let it go and skip it with the hope that the next day would be better. But that wasn't so easy. In the sense that Nicholas couldn't fall asleep, the guy reached for his smartphone at least to watch some video funny memes, maybe to look at the community in a popular messenger, where they published all sorts of interesting news. There's a video with a frightening headline shock. Wolves attacked a student in America. And in general, Nicholas was not one of those who likes to tickle nerves with all kinds of documentary horror. But for some reason, he started the video and froze, because the video told about the death of Jack, who came on a student visa for the summer in the U.S., Alaska. The incident came to light by accident. The tragedy was captured by drones sent to circle the forest to study wildlife. For moral reasons, we will not publish the shocking footage, the anchor said but you can take our word for it. It's just awful. And then a picture of the dead man flashed across the screen, and Nicholas swallowed hard. He recognized the man who had once been his friend, hastily closing the video. Nicholas was about to put the smartphone away, but it suddenly beeped with an incoming message. It was a link accompanied by a strange phrase. It was hilarious. My stomach felt queasy, and as if in the back of my mind, the thought flashed through my mind that I shouldn't open it. But please don't. It's probably just some stupid spam or from scammers. But my finger had already clicked on the link, and a video started on the smartphone screen. It's aerial footage. In a clearing in the forest on the mountainside, a man runs out, limping and stumbling, and wolves follow him with wild jumps. Or not wolves. Nicholas didn't know much about these beasts, 
but the ones in the video seemed like prehistoric giants. Apparently one of the drones had gotten lower because the angle of the footage had changed, making it all too visible. It was really Jack. Naza came to Nicholas's throat, but for some reason he didn't have the strength to close the video. He watched to the end, and then, he barely made it to the bathroom, where he threw up. His body was shivering violently. He started scooping up water with his palms and drinking. Nightmare. Was this all really real? Nicholas went back to his room like a halfling and crawled under the blanket with his head, closed his eyes tightly. Was such a thing possible in reality? It turned out it was. It seemed to him that it was impossible to fall asleep after such a thing. But suddenly he began to fall asleep, and before falling into it, Nicholas thought of something else. It seemed to him that the aerial footage was too detailed. It was as if these machines had been controlled to capture as much detail as possible of the beasts hunting humans. Are you all right? Sophie, whom Nicholas met the next day, looked worried. Poor little thing, did you sleep at all? Did you work nights as well? I'm fine. Gloomily Nicholas replied with a sip of coffee. They met at the cafe. It was a small, cozy and not flashy place, coming to which had already become their good tradition. And Sophie had insisted that they split the bill. Not that she was such an opponent of the tradition of candy bouquet of this period, but she always said that before marriage would prefer so said in jest, playfully hinting that when she rings Nicholas, then she will begin to pull money from him. It was funny to him. And, in principle, he would be happy to pay now in cafes, movies and somewhere else for his girlfriend. But since she was so insistent on independence, he was ready to meet her needs in this, as well as in many other things. You don't have to lie to me. Sophie spluttered. What happened? A friend died, Nicholas said. Wolves ate him. Is this some kind of stupid joke? She asked after a long pause. Oh, Sophie put her palm to her mouth, when he shook his head negatively. What a horrible thing to say. How on earth did this happen? I have no idea. Nicholas sighed. Jack, you don't know him. We were classmates. He went to the United States on a student program in Alaska. It was all right. He was interning at a company there, a fuel salesman. He doesn't care about the wilderness at all. I don't know why he'd go into the woods. I don't know why he'd go into the woods. Nicholas suddenly realized that he couldn't keep everything that had happened yesterday to himself. The link came from a video of him realizing, and I don't know who sent it. Anyway, I looked it up this morning. He swallowed hard. That video didn't make world news. I think the FBI picked it up. I don't know why, but I got it for some reason. I don't understand, Sophie said. So you're saying that someone sent you a video that isn't publicly available? Yeah, Nicholas nodded. Your order. The waiter came to them with a tray. Nicholas had only black coffee for himself, but Sophie said she was hungry and ordered a steak. The waiter placed the steak in front of her, which had been cooked to a minimum, and it was a juicy piece of meat. Nicholas swallowed hard. He was nauseous again and pale before his eyes. The sight of the raw meat was enough to refresh the impressions he had gotten from watching the video the day before. Oops, Sophie said, realizing that eating such a thing in front of him now was not a good idea. Excuse me, please, she turned to the waiter. But I won't. I mean, I'll pay for the order, but I won't have the steak. We have to go urgently. Maybe we should pack it with us. Politely suggested the waiter. Take it, Nicholas said. I don't want you to go hungry because of me. Nicholas quickly regretted telling Sophie what had happened. Yes, he felt better. But at the same time, there was a strange feeling as if he had stained his favorite, pure, sweet, gentle girl in something. But to return everything back, of course, was impossible. Rumors of Jack's tragic death, of course, quickly spread among close and distant acquaintances. Nicholas, if they talked to him about it, preferred to keep silent. And people understood it quite accurately and did not interfere with the conversation. It just didn't make sense. But Nicholas also couldn't explain how it could be connected at all. 
but for some reason he began to feel that there was some connection between what had happened to Jack and the mysterious threats that Andrew had received. No, it's all nonsense and bullshit. It's an imagination play. It's been a couple days since the scary video, a week, a month, and slowly Nicholas is feeling better. And the reality of his own life didn't leave much time for reflection. Graduation at the university, diploma defense, sending out resumes. The latter, by the way, Nicholas did without much hope, believing that the newly minted manager with a bias in the field of tourism will probably have zero responses and inwardly he was ready to accept the fact that he would start working a little bit out of his profession. And then, when he gained experience, it would be possible to try to get into a sphere that really suited him. Finally, the university was left behind, and one day Sophie came to visit Nicholas for tea. The girl looked excited. She, as they say, sat as if on pins and needles, and it was felt that she had something to say. Sophie said, I've been offered a job. It's fantastic. I didn't think it was possible. Well, 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 smiled mother-in-law. Tell me. Work is good. You should definitely get a foothold. Get a good position. Before you go on maternity leave. Mom, stop it. Nicholas exclaimed. Why? Pam gave her son a stern look. Then smiled again at her future daughter-in-law. Amen. What blushed? I'm talking about your future family life. Or do you want your wife to be on maternity leave for nothing? So that she then went out to work for pennies. No, honey, you gotta do things the smart way. So what kind of job did you get, honey? Actually, I was kind of found. Sophie told me. It turned out that she was contacted by a large international recruiting agency, which was interested in her resume, which Sophie posted on several job search portals. These professionals are also called headhunters, Sophie explained. They are looking for employees, matching people to meet certain criteria for vacancies that the employer needs to close. Basically, they act like hounds. I'm sorry, Sophie, but the comparison is unfortunate. Granny, who was feeling so much better today that she even decided to join the family tea party, spoke up. Hounds, they hunt animals, they sniff them out and drive them for the hunters. And then there are the hounds, wild hunt, and added thoughtfully. Phew, what a topic Pam grimaced at the table. What is it? Anne tilted her head to the side. I'm just giving my own opinion, drawing associative parallels, so to speak. It's okay, Pam said embarrassedly to Sophie. I really didn't mean it that way. Thank you, Anne. You know so many interesting things. Is the wild hunt a Scandinavian mythology? Nicholas's grandmother rode her favorite horse. According to one version, they target sinners, the souls they collect and carry to the afterlife. Ghost riders with hunting dogs. Whoever hears them blowing their horn is doomed. Grandma went on. In fact, Anne sometimes talked about something like that. Perhaps Nicholas thought. The fact that she had been a teacher of literature all her life. He didn't usually care for such talk. But now there were some bad associations. He remembered what had happened to Jack. Oh, Anne, what a topic you're bringing up at night. Pan shook her head and poured more hot tea for everyone. So what's going on with your job? She returned to the subject Sophie had started. In general, the salary is very good $3,000 a month plus bonuses on the results of work, free lodging. They pay for the flight, insurance, and all that. What flight? Nicholas did not understand. So work abroad. Sophie smiled, as if she was a child who was promised all the sweets of the world. There are islands off Mexico. I forget what they're called. Today, it is one of the centers of world tourism. I've been offered a position in a department that deals with premium personalized tours. They really need a translator from Russian to English and vice versa. I will translate articles for their website, magazine, contracts. Also, wait a minute. Nicholas interrupted her. So you're going somewhere else. What about our plans? What are you talking about? I thought you already got a job at our publishing house. Sophie, can you please explain it properly? 
I'm not explaining. The girls all tensed up, visibly tense. What am I translating here? Love stories in paperbacks. Nicholas, do you have any idea what level it is? It's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And it's an immediate career boost. And yes, I love you. We're gonna have a wedding and a family, and all that. But we have to think about the future first. Nicholas, Nicholas, come on. I didn't realize you were such an opponent of women's independence. Sophie folded her arms across her chest. Why are you so angry? Don't you get it? I understand everything. Nicholas felt irritation boiling in his chest and tried hard to hold it back. I just didn't realize that material things were so important to you. Oh well, don't quarrel. His mother reached out and ruffled his hair. He dodged it. What are you so nervous about, son? Sophie's smart. She's thinking about the future. You're smart too. You should look for a good job. You could pay off your mortgage early. You could buy a car. And then you could get a cottage. Okay, I overreacted, Nicholas sighed. Sorry, Sophie. Here it is, the rehearsal for married life. Pam shook her head. And you'll be divorced in a month. And I haven't said everything yet, by the way. Sophie's eyes, her smile, and her whole look began to blossom again. It turned out that in the process of correspondence with headhunters, she told about her marital status, because it was an absolutely standard question. Told about Nicholas, about who her fiancé by profession, that yesterday's student. And here was a coincidence. It turned out that the same employer has another open position just for a young specialist and with very attractive conditions. Do you know what that means? Sophie was almost squealing with happiness. We can work together in the same company. Can you imagine? And you'll be fine too. The salary is so great. Career growth experience is priceless. Nicholas listened and felt strange. What Sophie was saying seemed unbelievable. No. In general, he, like every university graduate, of course, dreamed of a good job. But for it to work out so well, is that possible? Probably, yes. In principle, it seemed to be like that. Nicholas grimaced. His head had been aching badly the last few days. Well, you'd think I'd be the only one with bad English. And the company looks at it calmly and vigorously nodded Sophie. You will probably work with Russian-speaking clients, and then, have you not heard that the best way to immerse yourself in a language environment? And then you learn a foreign language faster. Well, Nicholas, his favorite girl, grabbed his hand, she smiled, looked into his eyes pleadingly. Well, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Let's give it a try. If things don't work out at the internship, we can always come back. Can't we? Really, Nicholas said. He decided to give up. After all, who was he to put Sophie on a leash and deny her self-fulfillment? My mom bought me a book today, squealed Kate, who felt deprived of the fact that the adults all talked to each other, and she did not pay attention to her. The girl jumped out of the table, ran to her room, and returned a minute later with the book. She threw it on the table. The witch's tail fell out she was satisfied. Nicholas lazily glanced at the children's literature. The pictures showed a dark, gloomy forest in a clearing, with a gingerbread house in the middle of it. Genzali Gretel, he read some recollection of the tale. Some strange associations began to pop up in his brain, but Nicholas silenced them, distracted himself, returned to the conversation with Sophie about his future work. And in fact, in the next few days, thinking about all this, Nicholas was more and more accustomed to the fact that, yes, it is a reasonable, profitable decision to go for a six-month internship abroad, and there well as it goes, maybe everything will work out wonderfully, and maybe, he thought, they would get married right there. It would be, as they say, romantic. No need to spend money on a wedding trip, the sea, the beach, and all the beauties at their fingertips. Once Nicholas dialed Andrew to find out how the former classmate spoke unexpectedly cheerful. He said that the frightening calls had stopped, that everything seemed to be getting better in life. Then Andrew said that he'd heard the news about Jack and that he felt terribly sorry for him. 
Nicholas agreed that what had happened was beyond horrible, and he also felt sorry for Jack, of course, but at the same time he suddenly thought something strange. Boomerang. He'd heard that a lot from his mom and people around him. That everything bad and evil and low. What a man commits in life will one day boomerang back to him. And now suddenly these associations came to mind. Can it be that what happened to Jack is the boomerang, the karma of retribution from the universe or higher forces? Though it was unlikely, Nicholas thought, was it possible to compare human life with what they had done to that girl? She'd survived and had even left, started a new life. And then Nicholas stopped thinking about it altogether. After all, life went on. Some Pam, when Nicholas came home one day, she looked very excited. You wouldn't believe it. What's wrong, Mom? He asked. At first he thought Grandma had gotten sick, but Mom was smiling. So it must have been something else. We won, won the first time and immediately, as they say, the jackpot. What? Nicholas was confused. But I think I was beginning to understand. The thing was that Pam was a passionate fan of all sorts of shenanigans. She believed in promises like if you bought ten packs of this cookie, or that cookie, you could win a car. She signed up for every one of those raffles. And once a month, she stubbornly bought a few lottery tickets. And then the whole family had to dutifully sit around, while she watched the raffle on TV. Pam believed that one day luck would smile on her, and she had already had a positive experience. She won a teapot, a set of towels and another set of glasses with the symbols of the company that produced juices, and now Nicholas thought, something like this will be added to the collection of things that his mother will not use anyway, because she will keep them as a memory. But that was not the case. The thing was that Kate had recently installed a children's game on her tablet, and it was possible to participate in a drawing, and Kate won the grand prize. Cool. Nicholas smiled thinking that it would probably be a toy. You guessed it, Pam laughed. It's a trip to an amusement park. Come on, Nicholas grinned, putting his umbrella out to dry as the rain poured down outside. Really? And not just anywhere. It was important, Pam continued. To a foreign country. I'll be right there. She ran to get Kate's tablet, opened a file, and started reading and it turned out that the amusement park was on the same island where Nicholas and Sophie were planning to go to work, and that Kate would be able to get other prizes, mostly toys, and also that they would pay for her hotel room, and that they would give her a cake from a local cake shop. What is that? The boy was completely confused. Fantastic, Pam shook her head. The coincidence is unbelievable. It's a sign of destiny, son. There's just one thing. What's that? Nicholas rubbed the bridge of his nose tiredly. Well, they pay the ticket to the child. All that, but the parent's right, or the parent, in general. The accompanying person does not. Where are we going to get the money, son? It's expensive to fly abroad, isn't it? Pam shook her hands. But Sophie's a golden girl. I'm going to have a daughter-in-law. I'm telling you. Anyway, she's figured out a way for us to do it. Mom, I have a headache, Nicholas confessed. So, as with your friend to communicate with Andrew, this schizophrenic, so you do not have a headache. And how to talk to my mother about our family matters. You're sick. Pam's mood quickly changed, and she started to get angry. You should have just said you didn't care. But I don't. I mean she raised you to be selfish. How many years of supporting you? and even her daughter. Your little sister, your own little sister, by the way. And he's grown up, and he's turned his nose up at the cares of the family. Look at him. Isn't it too early for you to start a family yourself? A. Eh? Sophie's a nice, decent girl. Oh, she'll cry with you. Nicholas regretted what he said, and hurriedly apologized, and asked to tell him what Sophie had come up with. His fiancée's idea was that Katenka could fly with them. Sophie's point was that the unlimited amusement park ticket had no fixed date, and the deadlines for the other prizes were on a very large scale. And so Sophie thought they could take Kate with them when they flew for their internship. After all, it was advantageous in that for them, the adults, the tickets were paid for by the employer, 
and because from the first day they arrived, work wasn't planned right away. After all, they had to be brought up to speed first. One could theoretically have time to get prizes for Kate, take her a couple times to that famous amusement park, and then literally for a day, taking a day off already Nicholas himself, for his own money to fly home and bring the girl back. It would be affordable, because the employer was ready to give discounts on airfare to its employees under its corporate program. Mom, how am I going to be alone with Kate? Nicholas panicked. Not alone, but with Sophie, Pam said. And she, by the way, will become a mother in the next few years. And she's good with kids, so let her practice. I'll write you a special power of attorney, by the way. You know, so you can travel with Kate. Well, I do not know. Nicholas stretched. These sudden plans seemed frightening to him for some reason. Yes, I suppose so. But it was, however, easily explained. After all, it naturally made traveling more difficult, more responsible, more worrisome. But on the other hand, Nicholas thought, maybe he was just a fool who was afraid to step out of his comfort zone. After all, maybe this was the first time they had a real white streak in their family. And he would really be a total critic if he turned down these opportunities. After all, maybe, and it is very likely that they will no longer have such a cool opportunity to work abroad, vacation abroad. After all, my family, Nicholas thought, not millionaires, but ordinary people. And what would my mom say if he, a man who was already not a perfect son, now begins to argue and does not do what is expected of him? Okay, Nicholas exhaled. Okay, I'll take Kate with me. Oh, son. Pam shrieked, then threw herself at him, smothering him in a hug. You're so good. I raised a real man. That's it. She pulled away, wiped her tears with the waistband of her robe. Natalie, I'm going to call my friend. She'll be jealous. She was bragging about the new refrigerator. Oh, she'll die of envy. The next three months turned out to be the most tense and full of all sorts of worries compared to the way Nicholas's life used to be. He had to do a lot of paperwork for his work abroad. He had to prepare documents for Kate's trip. Then Sophie had to take him shopping. She urgently needed to buy dresses, swimsuits and other things. Andrew, meanwhile, left for treatment in some clinic abroad and asked Nicholas to wish him luck, which Nicholas did wholeheartedly. It was still very unpleasant for him to see his friend in such a state. Finally, the day of departure came. Grandmother was not feeling well enough. So Pam and a few other relatives and friends went to the airport to see Sophie, Nicholas, and Kate off. Oh, Sophie finally said, when the hugs, goodbyes, and the like were over, and the three of them were seated in lounge chairs, waiting for the boarding announcement. Nicholas sat and thought, why, despite the fact that everything was going so well, did he have such a bad feeling? Probably, he decided, it was nerves. No, look at that, Sophie whispered, pushing him to the side. And when she got his attention, she pointed to a couple of a man in a business suit and a girl in a mini dress, who were sitting nearby. He was reprimanding her for something and holding her hand so tightly that it seemed to be hurting the poor girl. The girl bowed her head and seemed to be crying quietly. It's disgusting. Sophie continued to whisper, I hate it when men are mean to women. Who do you have to be to do that? Lucky, she smiled at Nicholas, that you're a good man, a true knight. Naza came to my throat. Nicholas was suddenly flooded with an eerie clarity of memories of what he had done then, how exactly he had done to Neca. The first thing Nicholas thought of when he stepped off the airplane, it was that he didn't like to fly airplanes, and in general any kind of long-distance travel was not for him. And he also thought that, if it weren't for all this responsibility and sense of duty to his mother and Sophie, he would probably give a damn about the brilliant career prospects looming in front of him and not go anywhere, and would have stayed at home, would have gotten a job somehow quietly and would live quite normally. And now what? You can only go with the flow and hope that it doesn't bring you to the Niagara Falls. Ha ha. We had to hustle at the airport. They didn't find their luggage right away, but then they were met by a man with a sign with their names on it. 
It was some local kid. He barely spoke English, but he drove the car carefully and deftly rearranged himself in the dense flow of cars. Quite quickly he drove them to the hotel, where they were waiting for their rooms, prepaid by their employer. Sophie suggested that Kate stay in her room, and Nicholas agreed. The specialist from the recruiting agency had already contacted them on arrival and said that they could just rest for the next couple of days, and then the most important thing would begin. They would be introduced to their colleagues and slowly get up to speed. Nicholas, who had expected this, was quite pleased. After all, it meant that there would be free time to go for a walk with Kate. The little one was tired after the flight, Sophie said. I've put her to bed for now. I see Nicholas nodded. I want to go for a walk. Are you coming with me? No, I'd rather stay with her, Sophie smiled. You go, my love. You don't need to sulk in the room because of our feminine whims. Joker, smiled Nicholas, tenderly kissed his beloved and really went for a walk. And actually he realized with his mind that this tropical island is the dream of many people. But he didn't really like it here. It was too hot, too stuffy. And the prospect of hanging here for at least six months of internship, or even more, seemed less and less attractive. Nicholas stopped at the waterfront. The sea was beautiful, but even this view did not improve his mood. What am I doing here? He muttered and wandered lazily along the promenade. Street vendors and small shopkeepers were loudly, insolently hawking their wares. Nicholas's knowledge of English was very modest. So to him it all blended into a cacophony, but something caught his ear. Check your phone for viruses. Quick cleanup of spyware for only $5 for a deep scan. A kid about 15 years old was shouting his promotional offer, standing in the doorway of some computer hardware store. Nicholas wondered if he should get checked out. His smartphone had been slowing down suspiciously lately. Good afternoon, he said. I apologize for my bad English. I'm a foreigner. Oh, good afternoon, sir. The boy smiled. Would you like to check your smartphone? System cleanup. Antivirus installation. Check, please, nodded Nicholas. It's not long. Five minutes the boy grew his fingers. Then he snatched the smartphone out of Nicholas's hands and disappeared into the back of the shop. Nicholas followed. The young genius of technology connected the smartphone to the computer and tapped on the keyboard. Nicholas waited patiently. How is it? He asked impatiently. Sir, it's complicated. The boy said. He was no longer smiling, he looked puzzled. It looks like your smartphone is seriously stuffed with viruses and something that steals your information. Nicholas rolled his eyes. Here we go. Now they're going to scam him for expensive repairs, that's for sure. But he didn't expect what would happen next. Here, sir, the boy handed him the smartphone back. I can't help you. I'm sorry. What? Nicholas was surprised. He had been expecting some kind of service to be imposed on him. Well, you see, sir, it's like I've discovered something, but I can't find the source of the problem, said the young digital wizard. It looks like your smartphone has been infected by real pros. I'm afraid cleaning it won't help at all. It seems that hackers from the darknet have worked here. What? Nicholas' eyes widened. He'd heard something about a mysterious and scary place some deep level of the internet, a place you don't want to go if you're a law-abiding person and don't want to get in trouble. The kid tried to explain something else to him and said no, no money. He also advised that it was better to delete the SAM card and throw away the smartphone and get a new one. I don't understand why all this. Puzzled Nicholas tried to find out something. Are they hackers trying to steal this money? No, shook his head. I've noticed traces of a software that allows you to determine the location of the device and yours respectively, which allows you to send messages anonymously, redirect to fake websites, and maybe also listen to your smartphone. Nicholas walked out of the shop in shock. He just couldn't figure out who would want to do this and why, what was even going on. Suddenly, he stammered on the spot. He suddenly remembered that he'd gotten that creepy video of Jack and the Wolves. And he also remembered what Andrew had told him about the incoming calls 
the information about which then disappeared without a trace. But how could that be connected? You know how. A thought flashed through Nicholas's brain. The truth is just too scary. So you wave it away, you hide from the truth. Like a child hoping to hide from the monster that came from the darkness under the blanket. The smartphone rang. Nicholas jerked and nearly dropped it. He glanced at the screen and hastily took the call. It was Mom. What's wrong? Nicholas asked blithely. Because Pam sounded like something was wrong. She had called to share the terrible news. Andrew had had an accident. Here's what happened. The guy flew out of the country accompanied by the same psychiatrist from the private clinic. Andrew's mother, Mia. In fact, entrusted her son's health into the hands of this man. And the arrangement was about one thing. But when they flew to India, it suddenly turned out that this psychiatrist had some urgent business to attend to. And he just took off, literally disappeared. Didn't answer his phone. Didn't answer his email, like he'd run away. And then Andrew was reassigned to another doctor on the spot. And somehow everything changed so cleverly with the documents that the guy was redirected to another clinic, very small, private. You couldn't find any information about it at all. That's when Mia sensed something was wrong. She had, as Pam had relayed, the same maternal instinct that told her that something was wrong with her son. Andrew was finally found. And that's when the horrible truth came out. It turned out that it was the other doctor, who, by the way, had also disappeared. Andrew, without even realizing it, signed the papers for a very specific method of treatment, which in general was long ago banned worldwide, but somewhere practiced privately. And things went from bad to worse. Andrew had a lobotomy. Pam said in a colorless voice, How awful. A young guy. How is that possible? What in the world is going on? It's happening out there now, son. I mean in India. The locals are throwing up their hands, saying the treatment was faulty, but the patient took the risks. The clinic where they did it all. How is it empty? Who's gonna be held accountable now? Andrew's back home now. Normal doctors have examined him and that's it. He's a vegetable. Can you imagine? He'll never be healthy. That's terrible. How could they do that when this stuff's been banned all over the world for years? Mom, let me call you back later. Okay. Nicholas stretched out pitifully and ended the call. And he felt bad. And he sat down at the table of the nearest street cafe. He waved away the waitress's girlfriend, saying that he didn't need anything. The smartphone beeped again in coming chat message. Nicholas looked at it, as if it were a poisonous snake ready to jump. Don't open it, don't open it. His own consciousness begged him. But he had already clicked on the link. You know why you're here, don't you? The voice of the unknown man who had apparently filmed the video. It's payback time. But don't worry, you'll live, and he can return to your family. After all, there must be mercy. Even if it's for people like you. Right. Nicholas listened to that voice and saw Andrew in front of him. Poor guy strapped to a metal table and gagged. And then something long appeared in the frame. The ice pick was dubbed by the cameraman. Dr. Freeman, the man to whom the world owes this method of mechanical, shall we say, treatment of sanity, preferred to work with it. Here we go. Sobbing Nicholas began to poke at the screen to close the video. The screen went blank. His breath came out of his chest. A cold shiver ran through him in jerky jerks. What was that? What kind of psycho had sent him that video? A new message arrived on his smartphone. And when Nicholas read it, his world just turned upside down. The message was short but pithy. Your little sister is sleeping so sweetly, and your girlfriend looks great in green. Before Nicholas left the inn, Sophie changed her clothes, swapping her traveling clothes for a green sundress. But then she found a stain on it and changed into the pink dress again. So Nicholas thought logically, no one could have seen her in green because she hadn't left the room in it then. No one could unless there were hidden cameras in the room. Sophie, Kate. Nicholas jumped up and rushed to run back toward the hotel. Hurry. He realized it all now. 
It was a trap. Of course, what an idiot he'd been. It had been so clear from the beginning. No, it wasn't. Because the mystery man who'd started it all was obviously very clever. Nicholas could not yet understand everything. But he knew for sure that the objects of the wild hunt were him and his former classmates. And now his family was involved. The guy flew into the hotel, climbed the stairs to the second floor, and wanted to bang on the door of Sophie's room. But it was open. He stormed inside. The place was empty. The ringtone played, and Nicholas pulled out the phone with a trembling hand. The number was unknown. With a convulsive sigh, he took the call. Where are they? He blurted out, barely hearing the first words. Sophie, Kate, what have you done with them? I did. Little, sweet, sweet, sweet doll. Going to see the bottom of the sea. If you don't do as you're told right now, said a voice in pretty clear Russian. No police, boy. You can try, of course, but they all eat out of one man's hands, and he'll be very displeased at how naughty you are. All right, trembling, Nicholas replied. What do you want? It was simple he was told to leave the hotel and follow him to the crossroads and wait there. And before Nicholas could catch his breath from the rapid running, a car stopped nearby a black SUV with tinted windows. The back door opened, and he obediently climbed in. It seemed his life was breaking down, being twisted into mincemeat and destroyed right now. He just hadn't wanted it before, couldn't see it. At such a distance from the shore that it was like a foggy strip, swayed on the waves of the Caribbean Sea, huge yacht ship, registered in one of the ports of Sicily, was perfect in terms of technical equipment and served, in fact, a second home for a man who, according to his occupation, accustomed to put himself above all laws and generally accepted norms. The sun was shining. The calm was calm. Classical music was playing along the sides of the yacht, as well as at the deckhouse, and in several other places on the yacht, there were guards armed to the teeth. The silent men in black had not spoken a word since the prisoners had been brought here. They didn't seem at all embarrassed by what was happening. Kate, who had been crying her heart out, was now only sobbing softly, clinging to Suffy. The girl, wrapping both arms around the baby, was no longer crying and only glared angrily and frightened. Nicholas sat next to them on the upper deck of the yacht dear guests, or rather captives, were seated on a low upholstered cream leather sofa and told to sit and wait. Sophie, of course, rushed to Nicholas when she saw him on board. She demanded an explanation of what was going on, but he just threw up his hands and mumbled that he didn't know. He really didn't know, but only partly. But it took his tongue to say what he did know. So he just sat silent, staring at the deck. Suddenly, two men came up from the lower deck of the yacht. One of them was a tall brunette with a neat beard and noticeable gray hair. He was dressed in a black business suit with a narrow pinstripe, and on his fingers glittered several rings. The other was younger in his forties, blonde and dressed more simply in jeans and a light-colored shirt. The brunette splayed his arms, smiled broadly, and said something fluently in a sing-song language unknown to the captives. Signor Bianca apologizes for keeping them waiting. Blondin translated into Russian. He was delayed by urgent business matters. But he is now ready to speak with you. Would you like tea, coffee, or other beverages? What? What the hell are you doing? Sophie burst into flames. What other drinks? You kidnapped us. This is a crime. I demanded. You speak English. She jabbed a finger in the direction of the elderly senor. I do. His lips stretched into a smile. It is true that I usually prefer to communicate with my non-voluntary foreign guests in Italian and through an interpreter. It helps, may I say, to create a certain atmosphere. But for such a charming signorina, I am prepared to make an exception. I apologize again. Believe me, my dear, I would never have dared to lay a finger on such a lovely creature if you hadn't been unfortunate enough to be associated with this man. Nicholas. Sophie frowned. Do you know him? She turned to the boy. Can someone explain to me what's going on? I feel like this is a Hollywood action movie, and we've been kidnapped by the Mafia. You're adorable. 
Bianca laughed. Well, if you like to call it that. Yes, in the world it is sometimes called the Mafia, though that definition is a little crude for my taste. And as for the reason you're here, have a seat and don't refuse a drink. It's so hot today, and listen to a story. But first, he snapped his fingers, calling one of the guards. Take the girl downstairs to her quarters. No, Sophie twitched. No, believe me, the mobster gave her a stern look. This conversation will not be for children's ears. I don't think you want to cause the child psychological trauma. Don't worry, baby will just sit on the couch, watch cartoons. She can get candy, cookies, hot chocolate. I want, squeaked Kate, who had already stopped crying and now even looked around curiously. Uncle, and you are not evil. Depends on how, where, and for whom. Alfred grinned. You look like my grandfather, Kate said. Only he died a long time ago. I've only seen pictures of him. Well, I hope to live a long time yet. The mobster smiled almost warmly. Kate, honey, you really go. Okay, Sophie addressed her affectionately. The adults need to talk. She smiled, hoping it looked natural and wouldn't scare the child further. Okay, the girl stretched out and giving her hand to the guard sank down behind him. Will there be dolphins? She turned back to the owner of the yacht. There must be dolphins in the sea. How do you know? Alfred waved his hand at her. They might come for you. At last the little girl was taken away, and he spoke. It happened about twenty years ago, when Alfred Bianca came to Russia for business negotiations with one of his business partners. Yes, he admitted, he had a quite legitimate business as well. Why not? And there this partner invited him to have fun in a club. Alfred accepted the invitation, and there in the club, they were entertained by girls. The host swore she was an escort of the highest caliber. And no one could explain how a girl who had just recently entered this vicious sphere had gotten in. It seems she was brought there by her girlfriend to make some money because her family was poor. And it just so happened that Alfred was the first. With this lovely vicious fairy, he was surprised and thanked her generously by paying her a lot of money. The negotiations were over. Alfred went back to Italy and forgot all about that sweet girl. But she remembered about him, but not immediately, but a little less than twenty years later. The thing was that that girl got pregnant and decided to keep the child purely for herself. She got married while she was still pregnant, and the people around her thought that her husband was the father of the child. The girl who was born was named Nika. Years flew by, life became harder and harder, and the woman, who had once tried to enter the vicious illegal business, began to drink more and more. And then she realized that she did not want a similar fate for her daughter, and decided to do two things. One, divorce her husband. And two, she decided to find Nikki's father, and the name of that first and only client of hers, tightly planted in her memory. The search wasn't going to be long, but naturally, no one was going to take her word for it. The secretaries of Signora Bianca in general at first actively, as they call it, kicked this strange, as if crazy woman. She claimed that Bianca had a daughter, but then Alfred found out about it and got a little interested. He said there was one way to check everything. All you have to do is get a genetic test. Nikki's mother, by the way, kept the whole thing the secret from her daughter, and the test was also done in secret at a private lab, and then the results came back. Alfred Bianca found out he had a daughter. On the day Nika celebrated her high school graduation, such a tragic coincidence. After all, if he had learned about it a little earlier, that nightmarish thing might not have happened, and no sooner had Alfred gotten used to the idea that he, a man who for years considered himself infertile, it turns out that he has a daughter. Then he got another piece of news about what had happened to his girl. He sent his men to get Nika for the people around him. It looked like she had just left for another city. In reality, Alfred had rushed to take his daughter to his place in Italy, and there was no escaping how bad, how prohibitively nightmarish what had happened to her was. Because Nika was in a very difficult state. What had happened had hurt her not only physically, 
but also mentally. And if it had happened in Europe, America, or even Australia, Alfred would have quickly, with the help of his connections, figured out who had done such a thing. But where he had taken his daughter from, he had no such powerful influence. So all he could do was to be impotently angry. Naturally, with Nika immediately began to work with the best psychologists. She was taken to clinics, and at first it seemed that Nika is on the mend. But then it became clear that in her mind something finally broke. Alfred, by the way, he told her who he was right away. He didn't hide the truth, and Nika's mother confirmed his words. And Nika, to his joy, took the news calmly. He and she, by the way, had not talked much. The girl was not very talkative at all. But she accepted the fact that the man she had spent her whole life thinking of as her father was not her own. Alfred hoped that this new kinship would help Nika to regain her mental health. But he was wrong. The poor girl had lost her mind after all. She was afraid to go out in the street, in crowded places. She'd been frightened of men for a long time, to the point of hysteria. All except Alfred. So he had to hire a purely female staff, including security for the house he put Nikki in. Nekka's mother, by the way, did not wish to be around her daughter, and she didn't want anything from Alfred. Moreover, she hated him for that part of her past and her association with him. Anyway, she was only doing it for her daughter's sake, and when it was no longer necessary, she decided to return home. Alfred wouldn't let her go that easily, though. He said that he would give her money to buy an apartment, pay for treatment for alcoholism. Nikki's mother agreed to accept the money, but refused the rest of the help, saying that it was her life, and it was not for him to decide how it would go on. Only Alfred had a more bossy temper, and in the end Nikki's mother still went to a clinic for alcoholics, and then he put her in a nice little house, or rather, in a villa in Sicily, and said that he would not tolerate that the one who gave birth to his daughter lived like some kind of trash. In general, Nikki's mother was caught, as could be understood from the story, in a kind of golden cage. Alfred didn't need her as a friend or as a lover, but he simply decided to take care of her only because her status demanded it. It's been a few years. Nika's only daughter, and in fact, Harris, continued to live a reclusive life. And then one day she decided to confess everything to her father and gave the names of those who did this to her. And that's when Alfred decided to take his revenge, literally destroy everyone who hurt his girl, who trampled on her life. Nika could have been his lucky princess, his smart girl, his heiress, but in the end, she was like a broken doll. Yes, Alfred loved her dearly, but he couldn't just let it go. Mr. Bianca was silent. A drink of mineral water was brought to him, and he quenched his thirst. A silence hung over the yacht. Nicholas partly understood what the man was saying. From time to time the interpreter, who of course was a living person, but who gave the impression of a robot, because he did not react emotionally to what the master and his captives were saying to each other. Nicholas was the first to break it to Sophie, who was shocked by what she heard. No, she shook her head. Nicholas, what is this man talking about? Those people. Was it you? You did it. But no, that's impossible. She sobbed, ducked her lip, and began tapping Nicholas on the shoulder with her fists. Tell him he's lying. Nicholas, you couldn't do that. You're a good man. None of this is true. Nicholas bowed his head even lower and made no attempt to shield himself from Sophie's very sensitive blows. You know, I wasn't ready to believe the words either. Alfred said thoughtfully. I mean my girl, for instance, might have gotten it wrong, even if she had lost her mind. But that fellow Jack, he confessed I sent a man to him in the bar, as if he were a student too. They became friends, and my man got a boastful confession of such a feat out of Jack. That was enough for me, you know. And you? Sophie's eyes widened. You set the wolves on him. Nicholas told me. How horrible. You're a monster. A monster from your point of view. Alfred grinned grimly. It's true. Nicholas said at last. Yes, Sophie, I did it. I was drunk at the time, he added as she looked away. 
It was the first time I'd ever tasted vodka, and I would have given anything, just to fix it, to roll it back so it wouldn't happen. Now he was talking to Bianca. I'm an asshole, a bastard. Then why am I still alive? After what you did to Andrew. Andrew. Asked Sophie, is that still your friend? Yes, Nicholas nodded. He's been dealt with too. Sick bastard, what are you going to do to me? Feed me to the sharks. Then go for it. I'd really like that, Alfred said with a squint. But I can't get rid of you. Do you want to know why? And he spoke again then. Soon after Nika flew to Italy, the doctors at the clinic where she was examined informed Signor Bianca that his daughter was pregnant. This child, the brat of a creature, must not live. Alfred gave the order. For him, it was simple. His daughter's body was destroyed, dishonored, and there was no room in it for the little monster. But the interruption was resisted by Nika herself. Alfred, on the other hand, yes, he could have done everything without her consent, but he accepted her decision because he had managed to love his daughter so quickly, swiftly, and suddenly for himself. And that child was born. It was a girl, and they decided to call her Alice. Bianca quickly fell in love with his granddaughter and now felt like a real family man. He felt that finally in his life there was something to fill the emptiness that before almost drove him crazy. And now I am faced with a difficult question, said Alfred thoughtfully. How to punish the villain, but at the same time do not accidentally get rid of the father of his granddaughter. You know, it's fascinating that people come up with new technologies. Why do you think your former classmates died, Nicholas? Nicholas went cold. He felt like he was turning to stone. He knew the answer, but it was unbearably difficult to voice it. A genetic test. Bravo. Alfred clapped his hands three times. That's right. Getting a sample of their DNA was easy. And then I found out that there was nothing to stop Jack or Andrew from getting rid of them. But you, Nicholas, you know what I mean. This baby, the boy whispered. He's mine. He's mine. Right? Alfred nodded. There was silence between them again for some time. You know, this kind of violence against women has been done in all ages. Alfred spoke thoughtfully at last, and the attitudes toward it were sometimes very different. Where I come from. Back in the middle of the last century, a disgraced maiden was often rushed to marry the man who had dishonored her. That's how my grandmother got married. And you know what? It's like she forgave him in time and was happy. So I thought maybe I should not only keep you alive, but make you my son-in-law. Nicholas was gasping for air at that. Are you joking? He asked. You can't be serious. How can you? Your own daughter. You said yourself what condition she's in. And you're ready. Stop. Alfred raised his hand. So you admit you were wrong then? I was wrong. Nicholas grinned bitterly. I didn't make a mistake. I did what I did. I don't know about anyone else. It's the worst thing I've ever done in my life. And I don't know how to undo it. I guess I don't. So I'm faced with a question that doesn't seem to have an answer, Alfred said. And you know what? Fortunately, information about who Alice's father is, very few people know. So purely theoretically I can still get rid of you. Nicholas did not notice how in the hands of the head of the mafia was a gun, now pointed at him. Suffy shrieked. But before I do, I think I will not deny myself the pleasure of teaching you a lesson. Alfred's eyes had turned cold, now filled with anger. What do you say to that? If now I bring my men to amuse your fiancé, then I will end her torment, and it will finally be over for you. As for your little sister, you know, children are expensive these days. I think your mother will suffer knowing she sent her little girl to a place she never came back from. I think your cape will be a quick sale on the black market. Someone might want to adopt such a sweet little girl, or maybe they'll buy her for something else. Who knows? Nicholas didn't realize how he'd rushed forward. Not because Alfred was threatening him, but because he was now threatening Sophie and Kate. The throw was swift and agile. But it didn't work. A loud clap sounded above the deck of the yacht. Nicholas. Sophie rushed to the guy. 
who was settling to the deck, pressing his hand to his side and looking perplexed as the fabric of his t-shirt and his arm turned scarlet. Sophie screamed and cried. She begged for a doctor and cursed Bianca. She tried to do something to help and at the same time realized that it was hardly possible. Sophie. Nicholas whispered with numb lips and blinked rapidly, his vision blurring. It seemed to him that a storm was brewing, that the wind was rising, but the sea was calm, but there was a wind. It was created by the blades of a small black helicopter, which right now was approaching the yacht and coming in for a landing on a special helipad. Alfredo Bianca's men were running around on the deck, and he was hurriedly talking to someone on the phone. After a few more minutes, the hum of the blades subsided, and two middle-aged men and a young girl emerged from the cockpit. Nicholas sat with his back against the couch seat. The crying Sophie was hugging him, and the one at whom Alfred was staring with his mouth open in amazement was approaching. Neca. Nicholas exhaled in a colorless voice and coughed. Yes, it was her. He recognized her immediately, though she had changed. Her hair was cut short now. She was dressed in a stylish red suit and looked just like a cover girl. And in her arms sat a little girl in a pink dress. Nika, Alfred exclaimed. Daughter, but how are you? What are you doing here? Senor Alfred turned to him with a polite nod the mafioso accompanying the Harris. The man was the psychologist hired for Nikki about a year ago, and he also happened to be the only man she was willing to have by her side besides her father. Only Alfred did not know that thanks to the sessions with Caesar, his daughter not only slowly began to restore her mental health, but also began to acquire new, previously not peculiar to her views of the world. He did not know that Caesar and his patient had at some point developed romantic feelings. They had decided to keep them a secret until recently. Father, said Nika, I know all about what you did. Daughter, Alfred smiled. Looks like she really is my successor. I can't keep anything from you. I wanted to surprise you. And this is his finishing touch, she asked, looking at Nicholas. Help him, please. Sophie screamed. She realized from what the fiancé, who was on the verge of fainting, was saying that it was Micah. But it didn't really matter to her. The only thing that mattered was that Nicholas was seriously injured. And everything else, including the nightmare he'd committed, it could all wait. I'm taking him, Nika said. He needs to be taken to the hospital. What? Alfred was in shock. But he's the daughter, isn't he? Isn't that what you wanted? I never said I wanted you to do anything like this, Nika squinted. And I don't understand how my father turned out to be a man with a cruelty perhaps even superior to his. She nodded at Nicholas. Senor, what are your orders? Alfred was addressed by his chief of security. Load this scum into the helicopter, whispered the head of the mob. If that's what my daughter wants, please. Sophie rushed over to Neca. His sister Kate is here. We can't fly without her. Alfred was furious. He hated it when things didn't go the way he decided, but he had to do it because his daughter told him to. And he wouldn't have allowed himself to be treated like that in the first place, but she was his heir, and she would eventually take over all the affairs of his powerful mafia clan. Alfred honored his family's traditions, one of which was that one could not cross one's own hairs too much, lest one undermine their taste for power and damage their reputation. Nicholas was barely conscious of the fact that he was being carried into the helicopter. He had little sense of his body at all. He only realized that they were taking off into the air. He felt Suffy holding his hand and suddenly Neca. Hello, she said. And Nicholas could have sworn he'd never seen a sight more beautiful than her smile in his life. I thought I could throw you to the sharks myself. My dad beat me to it. He realized she was joking and tried to smile back but he coughed and felt a metallic taste in his mouth. Alice, Nicholas tried to focus his eyes on the little girl. She was so pretty. She has your eyes, he said. And then, lifting his hand, he reached out and touched her auburn curls. And it was so strange that Nika let him do it. Why did you fly down here? I thought, he said. You'd better not say anything, 
Neka said. Save your strength, I have to make it to the hospital. But it took me a long time to start living again. My dad turned up, but he's a strange man, you know. I guess he wanted to make things better for me. But he is what he is. She finished. I only found out about what he did yesterday, and that he took you and your fiancé and your sister. Besides, there's something my father doesn't know. Nika added and smiled again. He's already decided what the future holds for me. But I've decided otherwise. Interpol will probably be here any minute now. I don't want to continue my father's work. He's done too much evil. But Alice and I will be safe. The cooperation program is all business. I see, nodded Nicholas. He was very clearly aware of everything she was saying and he suddenly felt much better about both Neka and his daughter. It turned out that Neka had given up the role of a mafia princess and even betrayed her father. It turns out that despite everything she has been through, she was able to keep the light in herself. It turns out that she was not tempted by money, status, and power, which could have been obtained through her father. And to all this, she preferred the triumph of justice protection from his cruelty in general unknown to her numerous people. It turns out that even after everything that had happened, Mickey's heart had not hardened. It did not reflect anger at the people who broke her life. She found the strength to believe in the best, to choose what she herself considers right and necessary. Nicholas, Suffy shrieked as he closed his eyes. Couldn't you go any faster? Senorita, shouted the pilot from the nose of the helicopter. We'll be there in ten minutes. It won't help. Nicholas whispered. He could feel the life leaving him. Nick. The boy summoned his last strength. Nika. I have to tell you something to ask. I'm here, she said, leaning in so that he could feel her breath. She smelled of roses and the sea. Can you forgive me one day? And Alice is our daughter. Please don't tell her how things were with her parents. I promise I won't. Nika gently squeezed his cold hand. And I've already forgiven. Caesar helped me. You two make a handsome couple. I hope you'll be happy with him. Nika. Sophie sat frozen. Then suddenly she realized it was over. It no longer mattered that the helicopter was preparing to come in for a landing, and they were expected at the best clinics on the island. Nothing mattered. Nicholas parted from the mundane world, regretting that his mother his grandmother, his fiancé would grieve for him. But he also had time to feel forgiven. He knew that he had a daughter, and that Nicky had a man who would take care of them both. And in that, he had time to find his happiness, before he met eternity on the other side. And he didn't know that Sophie, back home with Kate, would soon meet and marry a good man too. That she would have a son, whom she would decide to name Nicholas.